Um, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Tracy Lovett Jones, who's uh, over here for a conference. Um, and I happened to see it on Twitter, which is the power of conference on Twitter. And I said, oh, you're in Oxford, come and talk to us here. So uh, that was it. She's come with colleagues over here, uh, Mandy and Natalie, um, who are from Newcastle. I love Australia, how it has all the same things. <laughs> Not been to Newcastle, you need to meet again. Um, so I'll let Tracy introduce herself a little bit more. We're just saying she'll probably spend maybe 35, 40 minutes on the talk and then there'll be time for questions and things. If people do have to leave, obviously we'll understand that. Um, so, um, and hope you enjoy it. And you're happy for it to be telling you all of people's yes, questions. Please interrupt me, question me, challenge me if you don't agree with what I'm saying. That would be really good. So, I've been. Um, Working as an academic for about 12 years. Before that, I was um, a nurse educator and a clinician for more years than I do admit. Um, but I love what I do, and I think I love it because what we do at Newcastle is when we see a problem, a recurring, pervasive problem that impacts patient safety or patient, the quality of patient care, then we say to ourselves, we've got an opportunity here. We, can, we have 2,000 students. If we can improve the quality of their learning, imagine what impact they can have. So for you guys, your students, the impact you can have on practice is phenomenal. So we, it's a very privileged role to be an academic. But I'm really excited to be here. I'm really honoured. And let me tell you about what I know about Oxford Books, which isn't much, but about... In 2006, I was visiting Southampton University, so I was doing part of my PhD there, and I wanted to come to Oxford because I'd always, all, always heard about it. I was born here, but never knew anything about Oxford, and got lost on the outskirts of Oxford. And this beautiful um, girl said to me, you look really worried. I was getting more and more anxious. And I said, I really wanted to get into Oxford and have a look around. She said, oh, we'll just catch this bus. And she must have read my face because I was thinking, oh, I can't catch that bus and change to that one. Um, she said, don't worry, I'll come with you. She said, I, I cross this um, Oxford all the time. I know my way around. So she hopped on the bus with me and took me from one bus to the next. Um, and it turned out she was a nurse from Oxford Brooks and was on placement and was going back with the boys. And she said, I've always wanted to do, um, what do you call it, a placement in Australia. So I arranged for her to come over for three months. <laughs> It was a while ago. Her name is Tiggy Wilson. She's now a community nurse. Um, she's a favourite friend of mine. Um, so she came over and she went to um, a really challenging but fantastic gastro ward. Um, really busy. And they loved her. And they kept saying, come back and work here. Um, and she did for a little while. But she was so capable. Third year student. And they kept saying to me she could run the ward. Which is just amazing. So she does like that. She's doing really well. So that's all I knew about Oxford Books. So I'm really delighted to be here. And I'm going to be sharing with you a topic that I'm really passionate about. And as I go through it, you'll see why I think this is such an important topic, why it matters so much. Please interrupt me at any time if I'm not making sense, which I hope doesn't happen. So clinical reasoning, what it is and why it matters. So what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit why, about why it's so important and then I'm going to share with you our story, why we recognise clinical reasoning as a significant thing that all of our students need to be proficient in, how we came up with the definition of clinical reasoning, um, how we developed a model and then we're going to talk about some of the errors um, that are made in clinical reasoning. So, some background. Healthcare errors are the third leading cause of death in developing country. So that's pretty profound, isn't it? 17% um, of hospital admissions result in an adverse event and 80% of those are preventable. And each year there are 3 million preventable deaths worldwide related to healthcare errors. So we've got a real problem. And the challenge is, you would think, if you think of any hospital, you have so many educated, qualified skilled, um, well-intentioned people all coming together, you would think that a healthcare um, environment would be the safest place in the world. But we know that um, seeking healthcare in a hospital in a developing country is less safe than hang gliding, less safe than working in a nu the nuclear power industry. 
So there's lots of reasons, and I'm going to be talking about one of the key reasons. Oh, those statistics equal 7,246 jumbo jets crashing and killing all 414 passengers each year. So if we knew that, how many of us would fly? But with healthcare, we have no choice about seeking healthcare. But we can make a difference. And that's because nurses with effective clinical reasoning skills um, have a demonstrably positive impact on patient outcomes. And there's a body of research to prove that. But those with poor clinical reasoning skills, often, um, this often results in a failure to rescue, um, particularly when there's a depending, uh, deteriorating patient. And often when things go wrong, we say, oh, well, obviously that graduate or that clinician didn't have enough knowledge. They weren't skilled enough. And at universities, what we focus on is more and more and more skills and more and more and more knowledge. And we assess knowledge through multiple ways, you know, lots of exams. And we assess skills through um, simulations, through skills labs and on placement. And for decades, they're the two things we've focused on. However, those things are rarely the cause of adverse patient outcomes and clinical reasoning is a factor in 57% of adverse patient outcomes. So we need to do much, much better. And that's clinical reasoning, not just with nursing, but with all health professionals because all health professionals engage in clinical reasoning. What do you think is the other main cause of adverse patient events? There's another really big one. Human factors. human factors, absolutely. But clinical reasoning is one type of human factors. What's the other? Communication. Communication. We know that between 70, depending on what research you read, between 70 and 87% of the errors in healthcare are related to communication. Communication between health professionals and communication between health professionals and the people they care for. And you would think we could get that right, wouldn't you? You know, we can all communicate. We wouldn't come into a health field unless we could converse. And yet we're not doing it in a way that um, enhances patient safety. Not doing it well enough, often enough. So, why does clinical reasoning matter from an educational perspective? There, because there are some people that say, hang on a minute, at an undergraduate level, let's focus on skills and knowledge and eventually... Um, through exposure, through repeated exposure, graduates will become good at clinical reasoning. It takes time, it takes exposure, it takes things to go wrong and they will learn from those experiences. Um, I don't agree with that and there's a body of evidence to show there's actually a little dip in the number of adverse events when we have a big um, influx of graduates. So in Australia, every January, um, we have the biggest influx, we have other ones during the year, we know that's when a whole lot of junior medical officers and new graduate nurses start and there's an increase, a measurable increase in the number of adverse patient events. So in the United States, they do a really interesting um, approach. Has, has any of you worked in the States? So there was a study done by someone called Dorothy DeBona and what she did was she took graduates, so they had finished their three years and they had graduated and they were working as practicing nurses and they had their licence. So they had gone through the NCLEX exam and they had passed and they had up to 12, between 6 and 12 months experience. And she tested their clinical reasoning skills using a really good approach. So it, really, it was um, kind of like serious gaming. But they sat in front of the computer and they were rapidly changing to tier, um, scenarios with a clock so they were timed and they were basically said, right, this is happening, what are you going to do? This is happening, what are you going to do? This is happening, what are you going to do within a time sequence? 70% of those um, nurses scored at an unsafe level. So, and that has been done um, over many years with more than 10,000. Consistently, um, it's between 70 and 65%. They also tested registered nurses' um, clinical reasoning skills, those who'd been registered for 10 years or more, and 25% of those scored at an unsafe level. And they are what, um, Dorothy, what um, Patricia Benner calls the experienced non-expert. So they are people that have been doing the same thing in the same way for many years and they'll never be the safest or the most profoundly safest. Yes? 
So de Bono had, they were scored depending on their responses to each of the um, questions and the number of scenarios they correctly addressed. So it went from you know, very safe to safe to neutral to unsafe to very unsafe. Mm. You can get it online, it's a really good study. Mm. So this is, we can focus on undergraduates but we have to keep in mind that not all practising nurses are necessarily brilliant at clinical reasoning, but many, many of them are. The challenge for students is that it's actually hard to see someone engaging in clinical reasoning. So students can see what an, an, their mentor or somebody they're working with does, so they can see the behaviours they engage in, they can see hear what they say, but clinical reasoning is a cognitive process and they can't actually tell what they're thinking, the rationales for their decisions, the structure of the process they go through. And we need to become better at teaching that both in an on-campus and an off-campus um, setting. So, um, in these situations, where, once again, where there's unsafe um, practices, Often, um, and particularly in De Bono's study, those graduates had good content knowledge and they had been proven to have good procedural skills, but they just lacked the clinical reasoning skills needed to respond appropriately in rapidly changing situations. So clinical reasoning really comes to the fore in non-routine situations. So when you're not sure what's happening, when it's a little bit unpredictable, when it's not routine, that's when we need really good clinical reasoning skills. So, once upon a time, I'm going to tell you our story. So, we have at Newcastle, and I was telling um, Pam at lunchtime, we have a, um, our final, student, final semester students have a um, face-to-face clinical assessment in practice in their last semester where a trained university assessor goes out with them and spends five hours assessing them. So it's two hours observation, an oral exam or a viva, then um, documentation up against competency standards. And we started that in 2005. And at the end of the 2005, um, the assessors were saying to me, you know, Tracy, they're pretty good. At the time I was director of clinical and we brought in this new process. They said, you know, they're, they're good to patients and they, you know, they respond pretty well, um, uh, there's just something, I don't know, they just don't seem to have insight or they don't have um, critical thinking skills or they're not good at decision making or they're not good at problem solving. Um, a few use the terms clinical reasoning, not many. So they had all these vague nebulous um, hunches that whereas the, the soon to be graduates were pretty good there was just this nebulous thinking process that meant if they experienced something that was non-routine, problematic, troubling, rapidly changing, they just didn't have what it took to respond appropriately at that time. So they would often go and get help, which was a good thing, but they just weren't able to process um, a tricky situation. So I started to think, well, first of all, what is this thing that they're talking about? You know, they're giving me all these different words, but what is it? And then I also started to go through the documentation. So over that year and the following year, I went through exactly 1,031 sets of documentation to find out what was happening and what was the evidence for what they were saying. And they were absolutely true, they were correct, there were problems happening. So we brought um, a group of academics together and said, look, let's just come up with something like that that we can fix this problem. Um, and it actually took us about 18 months to come up with a process, a model a, and a definition that we could use to teach students and to assess them. Because our, um, our belief was if you couldn't define it, you couldn't teach it, if you couldn't teach it, you couldn't assess it. So it took us a while to get to where we found something that we were really comfortable with. We had to battle with, um, first of all, some people saying, mm -mm, you can't teach undergraduates this, it's a complex Skill set, um, don't worry about undergraduates, they'll get it eventually. So that was one of our challenges. We had to come up with what it was. We had to think about, is nurses' clinical reasoning different to other health professionals? Because there's certainly definitions in other disciplines that we could have just used. Do you think nurses engage in clinical reasoning in a different way to other health professionals? In what way? Yes. 
I wonder with nurses, because you're exposed to the patient for so, for so much more time than other staff, whether I, I really like Liz Mirabelle's work around um, that tacit knowledge that you develop over years. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure. It, it's a bit about then as you know, yes. uh, intuition. Yeah. But I think, it's, I think it's more of an intuition. I think it's actually inbuilt knowledge that you develop over repeated exposure to different types of patients and different types of scenarios. And I wonder if that means that that uh, you know, maybe our clinical reasoning is uh, is broader in some com in context rather than just kind of textbook. You know what I, mean? I do know what you mean and I tend to agree, you, you, you said two things, you said because we spend so much time with the patient and I think that's the most profound um, reason. I think the fact that we develop um, tacit knowledge, um, intuition, I tend to think that's more pattern matching, we see something over and over and over again and it becomes embedded in our long term memory, we can walk in and in you know, five seconds we go, I know what that problem is. And it's not just, we're not guessing, we know it because it's deeply part of our long-term memory. But I think my thinking, and after lots of debate, we've come up with the belief that nurses' clinical reasoning is different because of what you said. We spend so much time with patients. We don't treat and retreat, which is what a lot of health professions do. So they come in, they have to, they do engage in clinical reasoning, but they do it reasonably quickly. They, you know, solve the problem, you know, go through the process and then walk away. For nurses we engage, you know, we may work through a cycle of clinical reasoning and solve one problem, but really we reveal another problem. And we're thinking about it holistically, we're not just thinking physically. So we're thinking psychologically and emotionally, there's a whole set of problems. And often we don't solve the problem, we have to start again. So for us it's a really cyclical process. Um, but really informed by a whole lot of different types of knowledges and skills that we learn along the way. There's a spelling mistake there, somewhere. So we're just going to move on really quickly. <laughs> okay, a test for you. What is this? It's an aerial photograph of someone. An aerial photograph, that's a really good answer and absolutely wrong. <laughs> a good try. <laughs> What else could it be? A leaf. A what? A leaf. A leaf? It does look like a leaf, but no, it's not. Is it a really old scan of something? A really old scan. A lot of people say that. A lot of people think here that it looks like some sort of bow. Yeah. No, yeah. it's not. It's not the imprint on the skin of a made sheet or something. No. <laughs> Now you're letting me down because psychologists will say that 25% of any group of people will be able to see what that is immediately. <laughs> Where's my 25%? <laughs> Alright, so I've shown you this because for students who are in the process of learning, many rapidly changing complex clinical situ situations are about as clear as that. <laughs> They can't work out the subtle nuances. They can't work out the defined features. And if they can't do that, then they really can't solve clinical problems. They don't even know the first step. But our job is to do this, to point out the details and s until it becomes absolutely unforgettable. Can you see what that is? Now, some people still get this wrong. So what do you think it is? Cow, thank goodness. Okay. Is there anybody that can't see the cow? You can't? So ear, ear, nose. Oh, you Can you really see or are you just yeah, saying that? Okay. <laughs> okay. So we've got to do this. We've got to put out, um, define the elements so that students can say, now I get it. Then... When they see, so they may see the situation, whether it's on campus or off, they may see the details because we've pointed out to them. And then next time they come across it, they'll still be able to see it. Can you still see it? Yeah. Yes. And, and who can't see it? Okay. So psychologists, once again, will say, if I came back here in 12 months' time and showed you that again, you'd know straight away what it was. So that's what teaching clinical reasoning is. So if I can teach a student that this, this and this is hypovolemia, 
Next time they see it, I want them to say, oh, that, that and that, that's hypovolemia and these are the actions and this is how I evaluate it. So, just in case, <laughs> that is a cow. <laughs> so this is the definition we came up with and I have to acknowledge um, another one of my colleagues called Kerry Hoffman and she was doing her PhD at the time and she did spent a lot of time doing observational work. So she, looked, she spent time um, on the wards in intensive care um, observing nurses and they wore uh, microphones and they, she taught them to think aloud. And then afterwards she did retrospective interviews with them. And what she wanted to know is what were the thinking process, processes they were engaging as they cared for complex patients. And she did really good work and came out with basically two groups. Those that engaged in a consistent, logical approach tended to collect less cues, but they knew what they were looking for and so they collected the right cues at the right time for the right person. And then another group, often, but not always, less experienced, just kept collecting cues. They didn't really know what was going on, they didn't have a hunch, they just thought if I keep, keep collecting information it will, you know, it'll come to me, I hope it'll come to me. And this group, the really consistent logical group, they solved the problem more often and more quickly than this group. So based on Kerry's work we defined um, clinical reasoning as a logical process by which nurses and other clinicians collect cues, process the information, come to an understanding of a patient problem or situation, plan and implement interventions, <coughs> evaluate outcomes and reflect on and learn from the process. So what I'll do now is go through those. I won't go through it um, in a very detailed way. If you're interested, um, I can send you an article on it. Um, Pam has a, this book on it. So we'll go through it because it's in the afternoon. I don't want you to get sleepy. The important thing to remember is that it's a cyclical process. We go round and round, we solve a problem, find a problem. If we don't solve it, we come back again. So it's, this is what makes nurses, clinical reasoning, um, a combination of the art and science of nursing. It's really beautiful. And keep in mind that when we teach it, we teach it as a slow, detailed process. Much like if I was teaching a student to catheterise a patient, I would do it in a really detailed, really slow way. But if I was catheterising someone, I could do it in five minutes. But we've got to break it down. And that's the same with clinical reasoning. And there's research that shows that in intensive care, um, nurses engage in clinical reasoning every 30 seconds. They're not stopping and thinking, step one, collect cues, step two, process the information. They just do it. Um, there's been studies to show that on a medical surgical ward, nurses engage in 50 cycles of clinical reasoning every shift, but um, they're not aware of it either. So, each of those different collect cues, collect information, um, sorry, consider the patient, collect cues, process the information, has stages within it. Now, it's not really that dissimilar to the nursing process. But the nursing process often didn't get traction because it was actually really hard to use. But what we've done is created steps within steps so that a beginning student can say, OK, I've collected all this information, but how do I process it? What do I do with it? Where do I start? So it's about starting with the patient. You walk in, what do you see? You know, is that patient... Um, are they grimacing? Are they sweating? Are they pale? And it's what good nurses can do in an instant. You walk in and you also almost intuitively know whether to worry or not. So it's teaching them those immediate um, responses matter. Then it's collecting cues and it's three types of cues. So it's about reviewing the current information. What did you hear in handover? What did the charts say? What are the orders? Those type of things. Do I need to gather new information? What assessments do I need to do for this person at this time and this place? And the important thing is that we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Knowledge is incredibly important. You can't engage in clinical reasoning unless you've got a really sound knowledge base and a range of different types of knowledges that you sort of pull into the um, situation. And it's about, most of you, experienced clinicians, 
Have your knowledge all organised. It's like you've got a filing cabinet in your mind and you know that for this patient I'd better pull this, this and this bit of information and you know it, you do it quickly. But for a beginning learner, it's like they've got a lot of knowledge. Graduates have huge amounts of knowledge but it's like it's all on the floor, you know, a pile of information. It's not as ordered, it's not as easy to find at the right time. So we've got to teach... Um, our students how to structure the information they need at different times. So let's go through this really quickly. As I said, the first one is consider the patient and look at um, what we ask them to do for us is describe or list the facts, context, objects or people. What's going on? Rose. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Don't know what's happening, but something's happening. Have done that one. Okay, so like I said, we review, then we gather new, and then we recall what we know, and then we process it. And this is the really beautiful one, where we start to say, what does that information tell me? What's normal? What's abnormal? Let's cluster all the abnormal and say, what's the story? What's relevant? What can I, you know, ignore? Have I got everything? Are there gaps? Do I need to go and get more? And then it's the clustering that I think is the beauty of nursing. It's where you take this, this and this and say, together, I think it could be, you know, I'll infer that it's this. It's the joining the dots or putting the puzzle pieces together. Um, and that's beautiful nursing. Making an inference. And then the last two, the match and predictor expert. Um, I've got to teach it, but it really requires experience. So match the current situation to past situations or the current patient to past patients. Um, and that's where it's really the intuition, intuition or the pattern matching comes in. And this one... We've learnt at Newcastle to use this one over and over again. It's to say, what might happen if you do nothing in this situation? Predict what could go wrong. And that's because nurses are really optimistic people. And we tend to think, oh, he's 15, he's young, he's healthy. I don't think I'll ring the doctor yet because, you know, it's probably nothing to worry about. But if you predict, if you say, if I do nothing in this situation, what's the worst thing that might happen? And it tends to spur nurses on a bit more. And then to identify the real problem, it's about synthesising the facts and coming to a definitive nursing diagnosis. Um, and some people say nurses don't make diagnosis, diagnoses. I think that's absolute rubbish. We are skilled, um, experienced people. We can come up with a nursing diagnosis. We're not going to say it's cancer, but we can say it's hypoglycemia. That's a nursing diagnosis. We, we have a of frameworks that are currently in the practice. <coughs> so, for example, the A to A, the agreement is a bit of a to go to one, and there's, there's lots of other types of frameworks that we use. And I just wonder what your view is about whether we teach um, clinical reasoning alongside those models, or whether or not we need to expand those from an educational perspective so that they include that clinical reasoning. And I've just got that sort of thing going on yeah. in my head, and I just wonder whether um, my view is we teach them alongside and integrate them. But I'm going to refer to my colleague Natalie because she actually teaches that. Explain how you integrate them, Nat. And you love being put on the spot, so they do. I'm not very good at talking unprepared, but anyway. But stand next to me so oh, we can okay. So basically, um, I come, my background is I'm an ICU nurse. So when I moved into working in the academic setting, I brought all of that assessment with me because we learn to assess. That's how we, that's our bread and butter basically. So when I looked at um, the way we were teaching assessment in our undergraduate program, I felt that there was there was a disconnect between assessment and our clinical reasoning skills and I thought that they needed to be brought together. So currently, so maybe I need to come back after this semester because this is the first semester we're running it, where we're running the A to G algorithm because the course focuses, the clinical course and focuses on deteriorating patient. So we're teaching the students to use a systematic approach to assessment because what we have found is placed in a situation that's unfamiliar and stressful, they don't know where to start. 
So using the algorithm of HG, it gives them a systematic framework to work with. However, we teach them alongside the clinical reasoning cycle. It's very important. And that outcome, the predicting the outcome, is where we keep coming back to and evaluating your assessment, which you'll, you'll see as we move on to the reasoning cycle. They're the key components that link it together because um, they really then, the picture becomes a lot clearer for them because they can see how Okay, I can use this framework to assess my patient, then I can actually apply the reasoning cycle to know what to do with that information. It's one thing to be able to assess a patient, but it's not to know what to do with that information, but it's also to know what not to do. Because sometimes it's very easy for students to go off on a tangent of what they want to do. But to learn and teach them how not to do something is a bigger step sometimes. So that's where I sit with that. So yes, it works very well together. As I said, it's very first semester, but I'm sure it's... We've done it in third year, in a foundation theoretical course, and it, and it went really well, so we're bringing it into the practical course. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to bring you more on the spot now. Oh. I'm thinking about specific frameworks, and we're quite big on the use of reflection and use of reflection frameworks and education, and also the nursing process. And we teach those and use those in our present curriculum. This will really be a great comment on how you would do that. The reflection. Yeah. So what it's it's very much part of the clinic reason cycle is evaluation, which Tracy will explain. But part of the, it's very important to encourage reflection in our students because that's where they learn the most. I work a lot in simulation, and that's the key part of our debrief because what we find is we use the reason cycle for debriefing um, for whatever we've been um, whether type of simulation is undertaken. And that, that guides us through our debrief, but it's definitely the reflective process is where they learn the most. And um, what we find is we talk a lot about their challenges and their strengths in that component. What will they do differently than they did in their first attempt? And how will you, what strategies will you use to improve your practice? And that's definitely what we try and encourage from day one, basically, when they enter the nursing um, degree, is reflective practice. Because you know as you work as a clinician, you do reflective practice. You probably did it before we even knew the term reflective practice. Um, but it's really important to get them to understand it. And it becomes quite subconscious. You find by the time they get to third year, they actually are doing that without even realising that that's what they're doing. And it's quite nice to see when, they, when they're clinically ready to go out into the workforce. So, yeah, so I think it's, it's a very important part of the reason cycle of reflection. Without it, we're not going to learn and move forward. I hope that answers. Thank you. Okay. Oh, so the next step <coughs> is to establish goals and that's really important and they have to be specific and time limited. So it's not enough to say oh, I've got a hypovolemic patient. I want them to I want them to get better, I want them to be rehydrated, I want them to improve. It's about I want them to be passing thirty mils of urine an hour within the next two or three hours because you can't measure whether your actions made a difference unless you've got a very specific goal. Time limited and a specific outcome. And then taking the appropriate actions and sometimes that appropriate action is making a referral to somebody else but it's really specific actions. And this is reflection. So it's evaluating the effectiveness of and actions of actions and outcomes. Oh, sorry, this isn't a reflection, this is a stage before. Has the situation improved now? Did my actions make a difference? Are they passing 30 mils of urine an hour now? Or did it not work? Okay. Do I need to do something else? Do I need to take a different action? And then the last stage, the eighth stage of the clinical reasoning cycle is reflection on the process and new learning. Um, what have you learned from this process? What have you done? Um, what could you have done differently? Okay. So one of the challenges with clinical reasoning, you know, I've described it as this beautiful, colourful, because I love colour, um, perfect circle, perfect cycle. In reality, it's not like that. It's messy and it's complex and sometimes you go halfway around and have to go back. Sometimes the stages merge and that's okay. Um, but one of the biggest challenges is before we even come to engage in clinical reasoning, we can have made a mistake. 
and that's because we have cognitive biases or clinical reasoning biases which are a little bit like um, a pair of glasses that we wear all the time and we see the world through it and we forget that we're even wearing them. And um, these are all the um, prejudices, the biases that are so deeply embedded within us that we're not even aware that we've got them. So there's a whole lot of them. Um, we've taken these out of um, medical psychology and these are the ones we apply to nursing. What I'm going to do now is show you one of them, um, fundamental attribution error. It's very common. Um, I'm going to show you that and then I'm going to show you an example, a short video from Australia that you'll find um, quite uncomfortable. It's um, based on a true story. Um, it actually goes, the scenario, the, it's a reenactment. The reenactment goes for an hour. I'm only going to show you about three minutes, so it's just a snippet of it. And it's one that I, um, I want you to know that nursing in Australia is not all like what I'm about to show you. You need to keep that generally with quite good. Um, so, fundamental attribution error is the tendency to be judgmental and blame patients for their illnesses rather than examine the circumstances that may have been responsible. So, people with a mental illness, those from minority groups and other marginalised groups tend to be at risk of this error. This is hopeless. <laughs> Police. If you don't settle down, there's going to be trouble, mate. I've had enough of this. I'll come back in a minute and do your obs. Pulling around on that bed, I'm frightened he's going to fall off, but he's just, he's just absolutely out of control. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, Jesus, great. Oh, look, don't worry. That was bad to happen anyway. I knew it was going to happen. Look, well, this is hopeless. I can't do a thing with this guy. No, I want you to take him to the police station. He's fine. He's obviously just pissed. I've had enough of him. He's disturbing the police, the peace down here. I'm trying to look after other patients that okay, actually okay. need me and I've had enough. Okay. Sorry, I'll just take his details. Oh, Dr. Goldman? Yes, it's Judy Rogers down in ED. Yeah, Matthew Jenkins, he's right to go. Oh, he's, he's been thrashing around, just being really aggressive, very, very drunk. Yeah, but he's fine. he's stable, he's moving all his limbs. Yeah, his Glasgow coma score is about 15. Yeah, it's been stable the whole time. He's been here. What did you think when you saw that? I'm never going to Australia. So what do you think was going on? She had been, the, the nurse had been in straight decision that he was drunk and that was it. She was not interested in finding out what the root cause behind it was or thinking any other possibility. You're absolutely right. Yep, absolutely right. So this young man, so this was based, this is a reenactment of a coroner's inquest and this was in a small um, country town in Western Australia. And this young man often was drunk and he often did represent to the emergency department. So um, he was known within this small community, here he was and she just saw it drunk again. Why is that a problem? I'm guessing he wasn't drunk. <laughs> yeah? For other reasons, she, did, she did, didn't even think about any other reasons. That's right. Um, it turns out though he was very much over the limit. But the other challenge is that that might not have been the only problem. He'd actually been in a car accident. Okay. Um, no one was hurt in the car accident, they thought. What else is going on, do you think? So what do you think about the nurse? Her demeanour, her... He's an awkward, he's an awkward patient. In her eyes, he's not behaving, he's not, he's not, he's not a popular patient. Absolutely, yes. Not the sort of patient that we'd really want to look after because he's taken up a bed. You know, we've got patients that like us that are, you know, are grateful for the care we give. Yeah. But he's also potentially violent, I mean, she's got to be feel vulnerable as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, what I was thinking of is there's a long standing difficult relationship between those two people, isn't there? You know, and it's about. How do you support the nurse in, in managing those sorts of difficult situations and enable them to take a step back and be objective? That's right, that's right. Um, uh, and one of the other reasons that I picked out that particular section 
is because are there any other nurses? No other medical staff? No one supported her. So generally when people see that they go, oh, bad nurse, straight away, bad nurse. But you know, she was on her own. You know, no one came and supported her with this very challenging situation. The other thing is um, she had worked 12 night duty shifts in a row. She was meant to have the two off in the middle, um, but they were busy and they said, do you want to work? And she needed the money, so she came in. So she was also exhausted and we know that if someone is tired, it's no different to, be, to driving under the influence. You know, it impairs our thought processes or our clinical reasoning processes. So it's almost as when we talk about human factors, it's not a pure situation. There's all these other things that impact on us um, and impact on our decision making, the way we interact with patients. Um, now there was another big situation here and this young man um, came from an ab Aboriginal background and in a community where there was a lot of prejudice already. He had gotten his young 16-year-old um, girlfriend pregnant um, and everyone in the town just thought typical. But this nurse's daughter had also 16 year old and was also pregnant. So she had that. We're human beings. We can't drop who we are as we walk in the door, but we need to be very mindful um, of how what's going on in our lives impacts um, the care we give. So what ended up happening was the policeman came, dragged him, pulled him out, um, threw him in the paddy wagon. Do you know what a paddy wagon is? <laughs> um, took him to a jail cell where he died. Died alone and he died because he actually had um, pelvic fracture and a ruptured um, femoral artery. And he died alone, um, which no one deserves. You know, doesn't matter what his history is, but that was a fundamental attribution error. He's Aboriginal, he's drunk, he's a frequent flyer, typical. Um, just get him out of here. Mm. But there are so many, in those 57% of clinical reasoning errors that I um, told you about that statistic, a lot of them are informed by those cognitive biases. And there's so many of them. Um, overconfidence bias, um, premature closure, we think we know what's going on. We don't go around the cycle, we just walk in and we think, oh, I know what's going on here, so we jump straight to action, you know, without thinking um, carefully. So... Oh, here we go. I'm going to show you another one now. This one's a little bit longer, but this is based on Lewis Blackman. We use Lewis Blackman's story in our first year course, um, first semester, and it is um, another example of a whole range of clinical reasoning errors. Um, but particularly that one where we are overly optimistic. We know what's going on. We don't have to give it too much thought. We had seen uh, a newspaper article about uh, a procedure for a condition called pectus excavatum, which Lewis had. It's a congenital condition that is um, fairly common. You know, 1 in 200 to 1 in 400 children have it. Um, and it's, the sternum doesn't grow straight, so the chest has sort of a concave appearance. So it was a cosmetic condition for him. And um, we had seen this article saying that there was a new, minimally invasive, very safe procedure to correct it. When he went into the hospital, he was slightly dehydrated. He was not producing urine. And um, after his surgery, he was... Uh, prescribed a very low IV drip, something um, more appropriate for a small child than a 15-year-old boy, certainly not for a 15-year-old boy who was already low on fluids. And we could not get those orders changed. Finally, a pharmacist rounded, and there happened to be um, a very receptive nurse who was a knowledgeable nurse. Most of them were very young, and they were not going to challenge anyone. But this, this was an older nurse who really knew what she was doing and she and the pharmacist got the orders changed. For his pain, he, he had um, an epidural with hydromorphone and um, bupivacaine and he had 
for an adjunct medication, IV Ketorolol, every six hours. The narcotics were up to, you know, very high levels, sort of dangerous levels for somebody who was opiate naive. And then the Ketorolol, which they kept giving, and it seemed to really have no effect on the pain. So he went in for surgery on Thursday. It was Friday afternoon before we got the fluids regulated. Um, Saturday he was still, um, you know, he was sweating, he was itching, he was nauseated. He didn't eat the whole time he was in the hospital. At 6.30 Sunday morning, which was half an hour after a Tordal injection, he was suddenly just stricken with this excruciating pain in his upper abdomen, you know, quite a different place from his chest pain. The nurse came running in, she was just leaving the shift change and she was quite alarmed and she sort of ran out of the room and then a few minutes later she came bustling back in and said oh it's nothing it's um, it's just constipation from the narcotics that was the, the diagnosis that stuck through thick and thin through every sort of evidence to the contrary that was the diagnosis he had over the course of 30 hours, he continued to deteriorate. He, he became septic. He um, exhibited signs of shock um, and dehydration. It was you know, he was fairly obviously in bad shape, and no one um, no one did anything. Monday morning came, and when they came around to take Lewis's vital signs, he had no blood pressure, and there was just the assumption that that couldn't be right because how could a healthy child in for elective blood surgery have no blood pressure? They took his blood pressure 12 times with seven different cuffs and machines. So they tried to take blood and they couldn't, there wasn't much blood there. They were trying to squeeze and wring his arm to get some blood out. While they were doing this, he, he looked over at me and he started saying something I, I couldn't understand because his words were slurred. And he said, um, it's going black. And I said, what? And he, he repeated it you know, with great difficulty. I, I just stared at him. I, I mean, I didn't know what to do about somebody saying something like that. And suddenly he just arced into cardiac arrest. And his you know, body went at all angles and his eyes were staring. And he was dead. You know, one of the things that, that people don't talk about because it's so personal is what happens afterwards, the effect on families. My daughter's childhood ended that day. She was 10 years old. She lost her parents at the same time as she lost her brother. We had had one of those houses where all the kids came, all the teenagers came. Suddenly, our house was silent. You know, and that, that's just part of it. It, it goes on and on, it echoes through the generations. Every time my daughter reached a milestone, it was a sad milestone. When she turned 18, we all cried because we knew who had not turned 18. I think that one of the big problems with what happened to Lewis was that people were following guidelines and protocols and were not looking at the patient. All the way through, there was a plan, and the plan did not include a complication. Patients need their caregivers to look at them as individuals, is the first thing. They need their caregivers to take their symptoms seriously, and they need their caregivers to research the medications that they're on. It's not just to, not to make assumptions. If someone is exhibiting a symptom, you need to find out the correlation of that symptom with their medications. To me, 
the overriding problem is just the lack of respect for the power of medications. People really don't, providers don't realize, and patients don't either, just you know, how much harm a medication can do. One of the reasons we use that particular film clip is because of the end section, because it includes the person, the child, the mother, the family, and because, you know, like you, we teach person-centred care. You can't divorce a clinical situation, adverse patient outcome, from the impact it has on the whole family. And there is really good research to show the strong relationship between patient safety and person-centred care. And you actually can't engage in clinical reasoning effectively unless you can communicate and engage in a person-centred person approach because you can't collect the correct information if you don't care for a patient in a therapeutic manner, engage in a you know, use a person-centred approach. You only, you only get half the evidence. So all those things that we teach are interconnected and you can't do one with the other. So even though this presentation was about clinical reasoning, it needs to bring in person-centred care. And that's why I've used that clip because it tells you the person's story. So why, what went wrong? Um, this is Helen Haskell. She's actually a um, patient safety advocate now. She's on Twitter. She's my Twitter friend. Um, but what went wrong? Because one of the things um, about this is that my first year nursing students could have prevented this from happening. So it wasn't rocket science. So anyone with some good nursing knowledge, if they gave, engaged in clinical reasoning, could have prevented this. So what do you think was going on with the nurses that they didn't identify that this was a real problem? Lack of knowledge? Yes, but they did take his blood pressure. Tried to. Yes, but they did take his blood pressure. Tried to. Absolutely, premature closure. So they did, you know, try to do some assessment at some time, but they already knew what was wrong. It's constipation, obviously. Young, 15, healthy, you know, having narcotic, obviously it's constipated. But they, but they didn't, it wasn't explicit how they came to that conclusion. That's right. And that's why, that's why I say there's no assessment there, because they've drawn a conclusion before carrying out that assessment. So it might be this sort of, you know, they, they are so used to doing things, they've seen it before, so they jump the stage of assessments. So Absolutely. And as she said, nothing would shift them past that. That was the nursing diagnosis. Mm. It was the way she described as well how the, the nurse looked worried and anxious, went out of the room, clearly spoke to somebody who hadn't seen the patient and then came back in and, mm. and said, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's, I can't remember exactly what she said, mm. yeah, constipation. So mm. she, the nurse was relying on what somebody else was telling her, perhaps over a telephone, mm. Rely on them, do you actually see the patient? That's right, that, that's, that's absolutely possible. It also might have been the experienced non expert. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably because she gave them what she saw yeah. and got confirmation back. Yeah. I, I read, yeah. um, read an article about 10 years ago in the Guardian, it was about um, someone called Warren Slater who, who actually made up a lot of the stories that she, she told about, but she tried to reproduce some earlier. Um, study, psychological study in the States where people had gone into um, different psychiatric hospitals and said that they'd heard voices. And, um, or they described hearing a sound and, that, and uh, to a person they, they, they were given uh, you know, loads and loads of um, drugs and uh, things like that, you know, retreated for um, psychiatric illness. And, and the article's end point was that um, medical diagnosis is often contextualised. So if you're a geriatrician who regularly sees constipation and you have someone with a dominant pain, they will have constipation. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone that uh, regularly operates on people for encitis, then you will diagnose encitis. And so a lot of our diagnosis are contextualised. So that, their expertise, that, that was what he was saying earlier on, I think it was, I was a bit worried about that until he showed those different areas of bias. 
Yeah, those biases. And that, you're absolutely right. You know, and it is, um, well, the overconfidence bias. You know, I know what it is. Um, but we all come to it with our own set of life experiences, professional experiences. And, and, and if something falls slightly outside that pattern, you still try and go into it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's very good research to show that, that what you're describing is absolutely correct. So, so collaboration is an important part of that clinical reasoning process, recognising that profession bias that's there. At, well, absolutely, collaboration. Always being willing to second guess ourselves. You know, it could, you know, we could be right. Generally, we're right. Um, but what if I'm not right? So predict. If I haven't got this right, what could go wrong? And that's why we say to the students, one of the actions may always be um, to refer, to seek advice, to seek help. Um, there was there was a signal in the show saying that there's, there must be a significant knowledge deficit there because clinical reasoning, based on what you said, requires knowledge. Because that person in that room, as as was said, came back and said, "Oh, it's constipation." Well, that doesn't explain the hypertension that the person had, and a lot of the others. There's no connection there. No, so, it's like they selectively picked some of the cues, and they said 15 healthy um, type of surgery, narcotic. Dehydrated constipation. Yeah, they were able to bring those elements together so they make a diagnosis. It's like they clustered cues, but the ones that didn't fit, just ignore them. Mm. Mm. What do you think about the blood pressure though when they tried to get the blood pressure? And it's obviously the machine, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, for me that was unforgettable. You know, that so what happens when it's failure to risk And this uh, swallowing your pride and admitting you might be wrong and getting someone else in. And yeah. Sometimes your ego takes over and above the patient's needs. Yes, and sometimes it's difficult, or you may have had, you know, what if the surgeon was one of those um, difficult surgeons? So you knew if you phoned him, you know, it's, it's going to have to convince him it's a problem. So you think, mm, look, he's 15, I'll wait and see. You know, we do so much waiting and seeing. And this was a, just before the time where we brought in escalation protocols. You know, we have um, what we call twin flags, and I'm sure you've got them. You know, different protocols if they don't. What is it called? Track and trigger. Track and trigger, yes. Now, they didn't have this. I also think that it was, could have been contextual because remember the mother said she asked for an honorary, I think she said an honorary, to come and see him, but her request was never honoured. And part of it, you know, if a family member sees, particularly, you know, with a child, I need a doctor to see him or I'm not happy. We've just brought something in in New South Wales. I can't remember what the name of it. Now, what's it called where the patient can, or the family can actually ring? Um, not ring. Um, but it's an acronym. Yeah. So, you know, if, if they're not getting the help they needed and everyone's ignoring them, the patient or their family can actually ring up and say, I need help. Yeah. Which I think is um, such an indictment on the healthcare system. Mm. Um, you know, I, my, I think there's another factor as well from that side of just the same reason. I think a lot of practitioners now, and especially with the, the move towards nurses, nurses have been empowered to, to make more decisions. But there's still so many other factors that influence that, particularly around resources. So if your skill mix is up, yep. we haven't got enough staff in, yeah, we work in such a hierarchy, then there's it doesn't matter how good those clinical reasoning skills are because there are other factors that will influence. And, and mm. I'm sure if you look at pocket contacts, in where, we, where we work now, if you look at pockets where there are incidents, it's where resources are not managed or it's a cultural thing. I think you're absolutely right. All those things, um, and that's why when errors happen, it's really one person. You know, it's a whole set of... Um, human and systems factors that collide. 
but there also should be inbuilt safety mechanisms. You know, you've heard of James Reeves and Swiss cheese model, that someone, someone taking that blood pressure or someone over that 30 hours should have had the time, should have had the resources, should have been able to make a referral. Um, and I'm also going to say something that you may not like, um, but I think there are times when nurses use the excuse of bullying. I'm not bullying, I'm um, busyness. I think busyness is so real, so um, such a pervasive, extenuating circumstance. I absolutely agree with that. But sometimes busyness is an excuse for not doing the right thing, not providing person-centred care, not being empathetic. Um, I, I absolutely agree that hierarchy and circumstances have a huge impact on safe patient outcomes. But, you know, 30 hours, there should have been somewhere in that time that should have said, this isn't good enough. Tracy, I'm aware it's four o'clock. Yes. Um, I, I don't know how much more you've got to do, but I know Last some one. people might need to go. Okay, okay. thank you. And we can take questions after I make them. Yeah. So I think I'm going to finish with this, and you may recognise um, this point. This this comes from the UK and I use it over and over again. It's in the formative years of, the, uh, of undergraduate education, the attitudes are forged and skills imparted which shape the quality of engagement with patients for years to come. Do you remember who said that? Francis. Yeah, Francis Inquiry. Um, and education must begin at the undergraduate level to promote recognition and management of the deteriorating patient. And you know I like that because it really validates everything I think about teaching clinical reasoning. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I really thank you for your time and for your engagement and for making me, um, for challenging me, making me think. And next time when I come back, make sure you know what the cow is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.